So our focus will be on how neurotransmitters that are released from one neuron will be used to signal a nearby neuron. So therefore, we're going to look at signaling that's occurring between two neurons within the nervous system. So in this example, the cell that is releasing the neurotransmitter is referred to as the presynaptic neuron or the presynaptic cell, since it is the cell that's found before the synapse. On the other hand, the postsynaptic cell is the, or the postsynaptic neuron is the neuron that's responding to the neurotransmitter that's being released from that presynaptic neuron. So when a neuron is stimulated, either by a neurotransmitter from another neuron, or by some other type of stimulus, like a sound, touch, pressure, or temperature stimulus, the neuron is going to create an action potential in response. The action potential is a brief electrical change that exists across the plasma membrane of that neuron. Action potentials will begin at a structure called the axon hillock, so that is where the axon is connected to the neuron soma. And once created, that action potential will spread like a wave down the axon, so beginning at the axon hillock, spreading down the axon from there, and then arriving at the axon terminals, where it will cause the release of the neurotransmitter that is stored within the axon terminals of that neuron. So during the action potential, the voltage changes over time at a given point within the axon. So that is to say, if we put a voltage probe in a small part of the axon, the tracing of the voltage change on the graph would look like the graph in this diagram here. The action potential has three phases. The first is the depolarization phase, which is when the voltage will rise uh, from the resting state or the resting membrane voltage to a peak of about plus 30 millivolts. The depolarization phase represents the initial uphill segment of the graph. So in this diagram, the depolarization phase is actually labeled as phase number two here because the first item is the resting state or the resting membrane potential. So recall that the resting membrane potential is the membrane voltage that we see in an unstimulated neuron. The second is the repolarization phase, that is this is where the voltage falls from the peak of plus 30 millivolts back down to the resting membrane voltage of about minus 70 millivolts. The repolarization phase therefore represents the downhill segment of the graph. The final phase is called the hyperpolarization phase in which the voltage will briefly overshoot the resting membrane voltage, and we see that the voltage in the hyperpolarization phase is actually a little bit more, that is, it's slightly more negative than the resting membrane voltage. And hyperpolarization will end when that voltage slowly climbs back up to the resting membrane voltage. So recall that the resting membrane voltage, or the resting membrane potential, is a voltage difference across the plasma membrane. If we were to put a small voltage probe across the plasma membrane and read the difference in voltage between the inside of the neuron and the outside, we would see that the cell has a slightly negative voltage on its interior. The reason for this is that potassium, which is a positively charged ion, is constantly diffusing out of the cell. Because potassium is positively charged and it's diffusing out of the cell, this creates a negative voltage reading, uh, which is indicating that the positively charged potassium is leaving the cell. So the negative voltage is simply indicating the direction of the movement of that positive charge. And because it's moving out of the cell and leaving the cell, that leaves us with a negative voltage reading. So at resting membrane voltage or resting membrane potential, there is a higher concentration of potassium on the inside of the cell than there is on the outside. And we see that the opposite is true for sodium. So at rest, sodium concentrations are higher outside the cell than they are inside. However, very little sodium is able to enter the cell by diffusion because there are very few sodium channels that allow for diffusion of sodium into the cell. We see that there are more potassium 
channels that are allowing potassium to diffuse out of the cell and across the membrane of that neuron. So let's briefly look at something called the all or none phenomenon of action potentials. So in this diagram, the top uh, image in this diagram is showing the action potentials that are being created as a result of a stimulus. Each blue vertical line is a single action potential. And the bottom image in this diagram is showing the strength of that particular stimulus. So if the stimulus is not strong enough to reach what is called the threshold voltage, we see that there will be no action potentials created. The threshold voltage for creating an action potential has to be reached in order to create an action potential or a train of action potentials. So that means that if a stimulus is very weak, it will usually not cause the neuron to reach that threshold voltage, and as a result, it's not going to fire any action potentials. So however, if the stimulus reaches threshold, action potentials will always be created. So the stimulus that's located in the middle of the graph and the stimulus that's located on the right uh, are both stimuli that reach above that critical threshold voltage. The action potentials that are created from both stimuli all have the same magnitude, so that is they reach their peak of plus 30 millivolts. The major difference between the two stimuli is that the stronger the stimulus is, the more action potentials will be created from that stimulus. So notice that the strength of the action potential was not greater. It simply meant that there were more action potentials being created as a result of a stronger stimulus. So notice that the stimulus in the middle just barely goes above that threshold voltage and it creates a few action potentials. The stimulus on the right goes far above threshold and it creates lots of action potentials. But notice that in both scenarios, the height of the action potential, that is the magnitude of, of those action potentials, is exactly the same, and all of them reach a, a voltage of plus 30 millivolts at their peak. So th it, this is what is meant by the all or none phenomenon. If a stimulus is too weak to reach threshold, it's not going to create any action potentials. However, if it's strong enough to reach threshold, we're going to see that action potentials will always be created.